<laughs> I'm rolling, sir. And now it's time for That Gets My Goat! Was that okay, Bob? Hey, everybody, welcome to That Gets My Goat. Eh, I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Are you ready to hear the rant that will proceed? Oh, I don't know if I have the energy for the rant. How many miles did we walk? Mm, a couple. It was like probably close to three. I'm not used to physical exercise or physical anything. Yes. The good thing is that prolonged your life one week, so we'll be able to get one more show out of you before you oh, keel yeah. over. Really? A whole week? Walking three miles it prolongs a life a week? But it tacks time on to the worst part of the life, the part <laughs> where you don't want to live, right? Yeah, there was something I wanted to talk about when we talked about Comic-Con. I guess it was a month or so ago now. But I went to the Man of Steel panel, and you know what Man of Steel is, right? A uh, shack? <laughs> he was at Comic-Con, remember? He was on a panel called Blacks on Comics or Blacks in Comics. And well, when I read that, I was just like, wait, what What does Shaquille O'Neal have to say? He shouldn't be on the panel. But then I looked and Jamie Kennedy was also on the panel. I was like, oh, never mind. Shaquille O'Neal actually belongs there. Well, Shaquille O'Neal did play Steel. He played Steel and he had a Superman tattoo yeah. prominently. He had a Superman tattoo well before he played Steel, too. So. And so, yeah. I think that was just him uh, self-aggrandizing because uh, he was that kind of a guy back in his early days. I, I don't know that he was a Superman fan before he played Steel. Oh, you don't think so? Though? Why would you get a Superman? Wait. Because he was saying that he was Superman. You get it? Oh, and the S stood for Shaq, not Super. Or wait. I don't know that the S stood for Shaq, but he's just saying, I'm the man of steel. It was back when he was when he was a rookie. There was a lot of that stuff where they're just like, this guy ain't all that, you know, because he was there. He was really hyped up and people are like, he's all hype. And he would do crazy crap for no good reason. Like there were times where he would go up for a dunk and, I mean, you've, you've seen times in the past where people do a dunk and they actually break sure. the rim out of the glass. Shaq would go up for a dunk, and instead of breaking the rim out of the glass, he would pull on it to where he collapsed the entire backboard. There was one time where he broke the hydraulic system that held the backboard up. And there was another time... <laughs> where he pulled the roof down, crushing hundreds of Almost. spectators. Almost, yeah. There was another time where he pulled the entire backboard off of the, the not just the rim, but the backboard and the shot clock. Everything came down on top of him. He was just trying to prove himself when he was a rookie. He would do all sorts of crap like that. Once he was older and had proved himself already and won three championships and all that kind of crap, then he was much more humble and a much cooler guy than he started out as. But I think that's why he had the S tattoo. But I could be wrong. Maybe he's loved Superman since he was a kid. I don't know. It's not like I'm his bosom buddy from childhood. So, All right. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our show. Thanks for listening, folks. The Shack episode is over. <laughs> I guess I I really looked forward to that Man of Steel panel. And basically, Man of Steel is there rebooting the Superman franchise the way that Christopher Nolan rebooted the Batman franchise a few years ago with Batman Begins. And they rebooted the Spider-Man franchise just a couple Just weeks this ago. year, yeah. It's a reboot era that we're in. Everything not brand new is new again. <laughs> because you can't say old. Yeah. Meanwhile, meanwhile Wonder Woman... Flash. Still languishes. Yeah, these these characters, they don't give a crap about. Yeah, they never really needed to reboot Superman, sadly, because they just did a Superman movie, what, 2005? Is that when it was? Or six? 2006. And the year after Batman Begins. It was good enough as is, really. I mean, you could have just kept going. It made plenty of money if they just made a, a second one right after that instead of just saying, well, I don't know. Uh, and now, you know, they could have had three Supermans in that series already and done all sorts of interesting stuff that would have got all sorts of people out to watch it. And they could have just gone straight into a Justice League by now. But instead, they've got to start over They're again. starting over. They're yeah. Five <clears throat> years behind the curve because of that. And, and that's a whole different episode, talking about Superman Returns, what worked, what didn't. People hate Superman Returns. And because I'm not one of those people, 
I've always had difficulty understanding the anger, the ire that they have, except I may now understand a little of how they feel because I went to the Man of Steel panel. Uh, just a couple years ago, the Coen brothers remade True Grit. And uh -huh. it was a good movie. It I was, Until that yeah, total good. bummer of an ending, I was just like, wow, I want my dad to see this because, you know, he loves Westerns and I love Westerns and we'll have something and we'll talk about it. And, oh, he'd have yeah. none of it. True Grit was sacrosanct to him. The John Wayne True Grit and the Duke was up for an Oscar. That was the only Oscar nomination you ever got. And I don't even watch the Oscar. And I was like, wow, but... But yeah, but this isn't this one tell it's more close to the book. F the book. And he's like, but this one kind of the main character is the girl. F the girl. You know, and I, it was the Duke or nothing. He had such closed mindedness. I was just like, well, can't they both exist side by side? Or can't you see this and and tell me, well, this is what I like, this is what I didn't like, instead of just saying, No, there's only one Rooster Cogburn, and he's John Wayne. Anyway, I just I had a difficulty with his attitude on that because I thought we could talk about it and we would have something in common and I'm always looking for things I'm trying to connect with my father but now I know exactly how he feels because there is one Superman and his name is Christopher Reeve and there's one Superman theme and it was written by Johnny Williams and F anybody who says otherwise what about George Reeves he was dead before either of us were even born <laughs> but he came first what about those Max Fleischer ones Okay, there's two Superman. <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird because we are... Uh, no, you know what? I won't speak for you. I am getting old enough that you know, I'm starting to not be in the target audience. The, the studios have care, started to care less and less about what I think. And hence, we get a Spider-Man reboot a mere decade after the last one. Sorry, a, a mere <laughs> four years after the last Spider-Man movie. But, a decade after the start of the last franchise. Yeah. Basically, here are my thoughts on Man of Steel. We saw a lot more of the footage than they showed in the, the, the very small teaser that's at the beginning of Dark Knight Rises. The teaser, and there's two of them, one narrated by Jor-El and one narrated by Pa Kent. They show the same footage of a bearded guy who looks like he's working on the docks. And they show every once in a while uh, like some flapping laundry on a on a line and a kid with a red tablecloth or something on his back like a cape and a dog and a, a seagull floating in the air and that and you wouldn't know unless you're really listening to what the dialogue is saying what you're seeing and then at the very end of the trailer you see a CG I mean you see Superman flying through the air with wind resistance in front of him or something and then you see the new s the new superman symbol the extraordinarily busy superman symbol and the the title and the and maybe it doesn't even have a release date on the trailer it just says next year next summer 2013 soon but i saw that and i knew already because you'd kind of informed me ahead of time it was coming so i knew what it was for before we saw the s or before we saw cg superman poof, puffing through the air with those little poofs that kept coming up again and again uh, what were those supposed to be, the poofs? Because they weren't I constant. I think sound barriers being broken. Was it sound broken. barrier breaking? I don't know. Because it wasn't constant, so it was like a you would be flying and then there'd be a poof. And then you'd fly for all and then another puff. But it, to me, it's just a reminder that there's not, not really somebody there. Yeah. It's George Lucas Duback stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know. But I see, I, we saw a lot more footage than that. And we actually, oh, maybe, I, I guess this is spoilers. I don't know. What do you think? Is it spoilers to talk about what's going to be in the movie? I don't think it matters hugely. I mean, we can tell people, I guess, if you... They felt like it was okay to show this to us. Yeah, if you're worried about spoilers, I guess you don't have to listen to this show. Well, you don't have to listen to it anyway. If... Yeah, when I saw it, they showed the teaser stuff and they had like boats floating and dock workers. And I was just like, what the... When did Smallville move to Maine? Why is it? What the heck? Isn't Smallville supposed to be a farming community in Kansas or something like that? We should be seeing like wheat fields and trains going through and stuff like that. Not a bunch of boats. and Yes, but the, see, these are the scenes where he's in Tibet or whatever looking for right, that right. blue flower. Right. And whenever somebody picks a fight with him, he says, your practice. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, we saw some stuff. 
And we saw Jor-El, who's played by Russell Crowe, and the main villain, who for some reason we're not supposed to say the name of, like, you know, it's blasphemy or something. Well, it's, it's Macbeth. It is the name of Zod you're trying <laughs> to take in vain. You see Zod and you see Superman and Zod fight. Then, uh, like Zack Snyder, the director, came out and Henry Cavill, who's the actor who plays Superman, came out and they they talked for just a second and then they opened it up to questions. And Zack Snyder, I've never seen, except for when it's like somebody being indicted for something, somebody be so closed mouthed to the press where like he didn't want to answer any questions. And somebody said, well, who's the villain in this movie? And he said, oh, I, I, I can't I can't say I don't I, I'm not I'm not able to tell you. And yet we had seen Zod and Superman fighting in the trailer. And so a few people later, somebody said, so how is this Zod different from the Zod, you know, in, in Superman 2? And he's like, Zod, I, I can neither confirm nor deny whether Zod is in this movie. And I was just like, well, was I hallucinating what we saw? You know, it was weird that. And somebody said, well, uh, Superman has a beard in the footage that we saw. Will we see him shave using his heat vision in this movie and i was like wow is that how superman sh- that's really neat yeah let's hear and he's like well i i uh, he does have a beard but uh i can't i can't uh, explain and i just i can it, neither confirm nor deny it was like that shave. how would you do that you look in the mirror and heat vision it off the mirror and get it off your face apparently that's how he does it my cousin told me that that's how he does it and i thought well i want to see that because that's a neat visual whether uh-huh. it would work or not you know, because we don't have heat vision in reality, it can do whatever you want it to do. I like that about yeah. fantasy. But yeah, you, where did the fantasy? I mean, the fantasy. A fantasy tattoo is to have a Superman movie that is a fantasy. Okay, well, just let me make a, a long story short that I was so utterly disappointed by this footage that they showed and that this take on Superman. Basically, they've taken the template of Batman Begins. And Christopher Nolan, who is producing this film, that who directed the three Dark Knight films, has taken his sensibility of a real-world Batman and put a cape on it. So it's Superman Begins, in essence. And I could not hate more the idea of Superman Begins. You didn't I'm like, one of the few people... Oh, go ahead, yes. You didn't like Batman Begins to begin with though right i was one of the few people that had a problem with a batman set in a mundane universe and and i had a problem with brian singer doing that with the x-men where they're set in a drab real world where there are no aliens or phoenix forces or magnetos that fly uh, you know and rogues that can lift buildings and things like that it it took what was so amazing about a comic book fantasy and stuck it in the real world which is fine i guess if you're the punisher or something like that but for the x-men i felt like what they were was larger than life and you know bright colored uniforms and and you know teams of crazy looking characters and guys with hair that naturally formed into horns (laughs) and and you know you can disagree or you can say that that's what you loved about brian singer because that was your gateway into it was was it marvel comics or x-men comics in general and so if you read in the comics that there can be somebody that has green skin or, or somebody that weighs a metric ton and all that, you're like, hey, that couldn't happen in the real world. But anything I'm trying to say about that, put it on Superman and it becomes multiplied by a factor of 10 because Superman is so much more fantasy than even the X-Men are. What is a fantasy? A fantasy tattoo. <laughs> Superman is an alien. He's not from Earth. And through magic, basically, through comic book science, our son gives him the powers of a god. You know what? Superman is the god of the 20th century, as somebody famously said. There's nothing he can't do. He's all powerful. He does anything that we would want a godlike figure to do to protect us, to save us, to show us the way, to help us or whatever. 
And what Snyder has done, or at least according to what few words he was willing to share with us, is he's brought that God down to earth and made him into more of a, a human being, a man, where you can see the journey. You can finally know what that song meant when they sang, What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus. Trying to make his way home. But <laughs> <laughs> I ruin it, everything, don't I, with my stupid comments? No, it's fine. And I fully expect other people to say bullcrap, man. That's what we need. We've never been able to associate with Superman. We've never been able to look at Superman and say, I see myself. And you know, that's, that's a perfectly cromulent opinion. Except for we don't want God to be fallible. We don't want God to make mistakes and be petty and arrogant and foolhardy and all the things that the Greek gods were. We want somebody who's an icon. We want somebody who is perfect. We want somebody who does the right thing as a paradigm, as a, a, a paragon, as a parahuman, a paralegal. That's the word I'm looking for. Parasailor. Yes. Thank you. That was just what I was looking for. The thing with Batman that so many people love, and it's not what I love, but I understand it for Batman, is that he is a human being. He's a man. He's like us. And if you had his resources and his drive, you could be Batman. I've heard so many people just say, that's what's so great about Batman is he doesn't have any powers. He's just a person who's done what no other person has been strong enough to do. But that's not Superman. Superman is not that. Right. Superman is perfection. And Superman is, you know, we always talk about the, the Boy Scout, the person that always does what's right. And so many people have a problem with that. that they, they're bored by that. They say, that's not interesting in a movie. And, you know, I can't really argue with that. I disagree and I think that there are talented writers out there that can make that interesting, but they tried rebooting the Superman franchise just a couple years ago. And Brian Singer, I don't know if he was a fan of the comic book Superman. My guess is no. He was but definitely he was a, fan a fan of the movie. But he so was a fan movie. of the Richard Donner movie and a half. And I love the Richard Donner movie and a half so much. We need to pull out that quote we haven't said in a long time, which is, why do you say these things when you know I will kill you for them? That movie came out at a perfect time for it to be pretty much the only Superman I recall. Now, there was the George Reeves Superman, George Reeves Superman, right. uh, that I did see every once in a while as a little, little kid because I would really? watch it at my grandparents' house. Interesting, because I never, ever, ever saw a lick of that Superman. I have no idea. The only thing I've ever seen of it is from that one documentary that was about like Superman through the ages. And they showed that and talked about the big deal about how he died and sort of the beginning of there's a Superman curse kind of a thing. But yeah, that's all I know of. I don't know if I've ever even heard him deliver a line as Superman to know what it was like. Was he like, I'm Superman? In a way he was. Now, and he wasn't the first. Kirk Allen was the first Superman. And there, there was a more bombastic way of talking in film in those days anyway. But the thing that I always took away and still take away from the George Reeves Superman is how old he was. Right. You know, that he was like a 50-year-old or something like that. And Alex Ross, who's one of the more famous, he's the most famous comic book painter rather than a penciler or whatever, he always draws Superman looking like he's 50 or something like that. And it always bothers me. Sideshow Collectibles just made a statue of him. And I was like, oh my gosh, that looks so cool because the cape is blowing in the wind and, you know, it's $899 or whatever. And I went and I looked <laughs> at it and the face is the face of an old the man. Old Alex Ross. Yeah, he does that with everybody though. And they always look like kind of fat too, like not your usual proportions that you tend to get from comic books where everybody's like super ripped. You know, the gigantic shoulders and pecs and they have a great, you know, thin waist that comes in and the gigantic thighs and in his, they're more actual person proportions. And so what like a, a really buffed guy would look like, they almost look like the guys that you see, like, for example, the guy that used to play like Hercules in those old films, you know, Steve Reeves. Was that really his name? 
uh, unless you're thinking of Lou Ferrigno. And no, I no, I, that's interesting that the, everybody we talk about today is named Reeves. This is all. <laughs> But yeah, you have that kind of the, the 50s look of a muscular guy where they were just thick. They weren't defined. They were just thick, which is valid. You know, that's the way people were muscly before they would spend time just doing 100 curls or something to get that nice definition from one muscle to the other. But it makes them look fat to me. Is That's <laughs> the reason why I don't like it. Well, that's how I thought that Tom Hardy sort of looked like in Dark Knight as Bane. Right, yeah. There was so much mass to him. Yeah. But it wasn't like veiny, tight comic book muscle or whatever. It was just, this is a giant guy. It almost looked like blah, bulk. What's the word I'm looking for? Like thickness. Fat. Fat, yeah, you could say fat. And yes. there are people that really love Alex Ross's art. And I'm mm-hmm. not one of them. I hate yeah. the super real. Like he, he's done some Marvel stuff and you see what Spider-Man would have to really look like. And he's done like a green goblin mask where you can actually see the guy under the mask and all that. And I hate that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it still looks better than the Power Ranger Sam Raimi yeah. green goblin, but all things look better than that. The drawing that my daughter did uh, last week looks better than that. So... <laughs> I guess the the thing I was uh, was saying before I derailed was Chris Reeves Superman, the 1978 Superman came out when I was just a little, little kid and old enough that that was it. That was my introduction. Now, I'd also seen the Super Friends and I'm sure you had too. Yeah. But there was something about a real guy and and the, the way the movie was made, it's so cutting edge, the flying scenes or whatever looked so real And then I was young enough to still believe in such things. And it just made an impact on me. And when I was seven years old, I put a red towel on my around my neck and I I put a bunch of chairs and things onto the bed and I jumped off trying to fly and it didn't work. I I had a sling. I, I didn't actually break my arm. But I have pictures of from my seventh birthday with that sling on, <laughs> and it uh, it just awesome. it was I believed in this character, and sometimes those things stay with you, and I'll never not associate Superman with that John Williams music, right. which in my opinion is the greatest music Williams ever did. It grabbed me, and then when the very first Comic Con I ever went to was the one where Brian Singer was there presenting Superman Returns, just like Zack Snyder was there presenting Man of Steel now. And they showed us all this footage, including some of the stuff from him out in space that never even made it. I think it might be on the Blu-ray now. But, you know, it was supposed to be saved for Man of Steel, which was the sequel to Superman Returns. But it had the John Williams music under it, specifically the, the Smallville theme and it was just so moving to me that it's, you know, it cemented me as a fan of Comic-Con forever because that was my first trip it's there. It's funny because I had a similar sort of experience with that John Williams music in that film. I was never all that excited. I mean, you told me about it, etc. And I was, ne- but I was never all that excited about this new Superman movie until the commercials started coming out. They show the commercial and then you see Superman like fly through town and you hear that music go. And as soon as I heard that music and saw Superman, I was just like, oh, I think I'm going to have to go see this movie. It got me all excited just hearing that music. It's funny how that happens, but I'm totally the same way with the music. There's so much good stuff in the Superman score. I've made up a playlist of various songs to jog to. Just the songs that are the the ones that like inspire me to push forward more as I'm running. And yeah, that Superman theme, I put that right at the top. That was the very first song that I put on there because yeah, it totally, there's just something about it. And I'll I'll even find myself sometimes running down the street and I'll be like waving my hands and bum bum, you know. (laughs) <laughs> doing it along with it as I'm running, uh, doing stuff like that because I just love 
that music. It's so wonderful. I want there to be a Superman in a universe where you can have a Bizarro and a Metallo and a Mix Six and and, and you know, these all these hey, hold on fantastical things. Hold on a sec. Before you get into that whole bit, we've gone pretty long already, so let's cut it off here and then we'll come back next week. No, I can't have been taught. Oh, okay, I have. You're right. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. As if anyone would want to copy this crap. 